Okay, here we're going to look at the transport and exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen. This occurs through the bicarbonate buffer system. So when we're talking about carbon dioxide being carried in red blood cells in exchange for oxygen, that is what's occurring in the broad sense. But here we're going to look a little bit more at the molecular level to understand in greater detail what's actually occurring here. Now to start off, the transport and exchange of oxygen. Hemoglobin binds with oxygen within red blood cells. We see this example here. Here's our hemoglobin. It looks like it's moving. It is. It's changing shape. In one case, we have it deoxygenated. In one case, oxygenated. So there's are deoxygenated, there's are oxygenated. So it does change shape when bound with oxygen. When this hemoglobin is binding in the red blood cells with the oxygen, this will cause more to diffuse into the blood plasma, from the blood plasma. In lungs, most hemoglobin molecules carry a full load of oxygen. And that can be called our R state. That's known as our relaxed state. This is when the hemoglobin is fully oxygenated. And again, because it's occurring through the process of diffusion, as we're binding our oxygen to our hemoglobin, more can diffuse in from the blood plasma. pH also influences that. A decrease in pH causes greater release of oxygen from hemoglobin. Why is that important? Well, as cells metabolize glucose, carbon dioxide is released into the blood. This causes two main things to happen an increase in the carbon dioxide, pressure of carbon dioxide, and hydrogen ion concentration in capillary blood. Keep in mind, pH stands for the measure of hydrogen ions. If we're increasing our hydrogen ion concentration, what we're essentially doing is decreasing our pH, causing acidosis. This decrease in pH, this acidic environment, can weaken the hemoglobin to oxygen bonds. So it's important that we don't let our blood get too low or too acidic, because that can completely break apart our ability to bind oxygen. Continuing on, carbon dioxide is transported into blood in three main forms. One is dissolved in the plasma, and this only accounts for about 7 to 10 percent. It can be chemically bound to hemoglobin, since so about 20 percent is carried in red blood cells. So this is very complex um, molecule here as carbonaminohemoglobin. The vast majority, or 70 percent, is transported as a bicarbonate ion. What does that look like? HCO3, the minus sign, that's a bicarbonate ion. So you can see here, some is carried in the red blood cell. Here's our bicarbonate ion dissolved in the plasma as carbonic acid. So as the name kind of implies, acidic environment. Lastly, we have some carbon dioxide dissolved within the plasma. So this carbonic acid and this acid in general is something we want to keep track of. So transport and exchange of carbon dioxide. Well, looking at this kind of equation here, if you're not familiar with chemist chemical equations, this arrow means the reaction is continuing this way and a reverse arrow mean the opposite is happening. So carbon dioxide diffuses in red blood cells and combines with water to form carbonic acid. So here's our carbon dioxide combines with water to form our carbonic acid. So that's going this way, which will quickly dissociate or break apart into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. It's going this way. However, in red blood cells, carbonic anhydrase, we see here, is an enzyme, and that can reversibly catalyze the conversion of carbon dioxide and water into carbonic acid. So there's a lot going on here. The key part is carbon dioxide and water will break down and form carbon carbonic acid. This carbonic acid can break apart, or as we call it, dissociate into carb carbonate and hydrogen ions. And this hydrogen ion concentration, if this gets too high, this will cause a decrease in our blood pH, creating a more acidic environment, which can be very dangerous uh, to our blood respiratory and circulatory system. So looking at it here, uh, a little more of a pictorial level, at the tissue level, <clears throat> bicarbonate quickly diffuses from red blood cells into the plasma. Uh, the chloride shift to counterbalance the outrush of negative bicarbonate ions from red blood cells. Chloride ions, Cl-, move from the plasma into the erythrocytes. So what's going on here? We have this exchange of our negative charges. Uh, we have our oxygen moving. And this is occurring at the tissue level that are respiring. So the respiring, so they're requiring oxygen that's going into the cells. And as we see, carbon dioxide is leaving. Now it's leaving and going into different forms. Here it's combining with the hemoglobin. Here it's combining with the water to form um, our carb carbonate ions. And here it's simply dissolving into the blood plasma. So this again shows you pictorially the three different steps that we talked about in this slide here. So dissolved, chemically bound, and bicarbonate ion, we see them all pictured here. Oxygen is simply diffusing into the cells. At the lungs, these processes are simply reversed. Here we see our carbon dioxide leaving and our oxygen entering. 
So bicarbonate ions move into the red blood cells and bind to form with hydrogen ions to form carbonic acid. The carbonic acid is then split by carbonic anhydrase. Remember, that's an enzyme to release carbon dioxide in water. It's right here. This is the enzyme. Carbon dioxide can also diffuse from the blood to the al al alveoli. So this is occurring in the alveoli within the actual lungs. High surface area allowing for this exchange to occur. Influence of carbon dioxide on blood pH. This is the important part. The carbonic acid and bicarbonate buffer system resist blood pH changes. This is a good thing. This is that buffer system. We have the acid and the bicarbonate kind of playing off one another. If hydrogen ion concentrations in the blood begin to rise, which is excessive hydrogen ions being added to the system, they can be removed by combining with this carbonate. If hydrogen ion concentrations begin to drop, carbonic acid can dissociate, releasing hydrogen ions. So because we have a way to both take in excessive hydrogen ions and also release hydrogen ions, this is how we develop this buffer system here. We're able to buffer the system. We're able to, if something gets too high, we can bring it down. And if it gets down, we can start bringing it up. This is maintaining our blood pH in approximately that 7.35 to 7.45 level. Very tight control. Lastly, our respiratory rate um, can change, uh, can also alter our blood pH. It's important to provide fast-acting system to adjust pH when it's disturbed by metabolic factors. If we're going for a quick run and a burst of energy, that could potentially shift our pH. We need a way to quickly be able to correct that and prevent it from getting outside of that normal range. If it does, we could have our proteins not function properly, we could have reduced oxygen levels to certain parts of the body, and all negative things could basically happen if this buffer system was to fail. We keep in mind, we have this um, bicarbonate buffer system and this carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange that's occurring, and hopefully now you can appreciate what's occurring a little bit more at the molecular level.